Welcome to the 16th episode of Season 3 of the Ubuntu UK Podcast. It's Monday the 13th of September 2010, and in this episode we're going to talk about whether developers should be artists. We're going to talk to Andrew Woffer about OpenSUSE, and we will of course cover the latest news, events, a bit about Ubuntu, and go over your feedback. I'm Tony, and with me this week, well, first off it's Laura. Hi Laura. Hello. How are you doing? You alright? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. Cool. What have you been up to recently? I'm about to start a part-time PhD and go part-time at work. So the geeky aspect of that is that I've been looking at LaTeX and TechMaker as uh, tools for writing theses and Mendeley. Is theses the correct plural? I think it is. Okay, good. (laughs) And And what's Mendeley? Mendeley Mendeley.com is fantastic. It's it's for cataloguing all your PDFs of papers and reports and things. And um, if it's not actually fully open source, but there is a request feature request to make it so. Oh, cool, but it's partly open source or something. It uses open source libraries, which you can download. Oh, okay, good to see they're sticking to the GPL. Okay, and there's no Alan tonight, and there's no Dave, and there's no Simon. Um, so we're very pleased to welcome a guest presenter for this episode, who is Mark Johnson. Hi, Mark. Hello, Tony. How are you doing? You right? I'm not too bad, thanks. Okay, so give us a 30-second pitch, the elevator pitch for Mark Johnson. Who are you? What do you do? What's your interest in Linux or open source? Um, okay, well, I'm a web developer by trade and a general geek by hobby and association <laughs> and so on. Um, I'm basically a PHP coder. My job at the moment, I work on the Moodle virtual, virtual learning environment, which is uh, an open source system used in a lot of universities and colleges and schools all around the world. Cool. Um, and Linux, I just like it because it's more, well, easier to develop on than any other system, really. Cool. And you're an Ubuntu user, is that I'm right? an Ubuntu user, or okay. almost exclusively. Um, I run Android on my phone. That's about the only other. <laughs> oh, in fact, no. No, to be fair, I'm primarily a Kubuntu user. Ooh. 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 That's, that's good, Laura. Yes. It's that's good, good to have the... A KD user on a, on a Linux podcast. Exactly. Wow. We, we have to embrace diversity, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> and ironically, you've got a blue pop shield on your microphone. I do, which yes. Is, we didn't and I've know. got an orange one. Yeah, what's that all about? Mine's a bit Surely passe. yours should be an aubergine. Yeah. <laughs> no, that would look silly on the end of a microphone. Um, <laughs> we oh. tried that at Og Camp. Yeah, that's, that's true. And in fact, for people who were at Og Camp, Mark was the one on stage talking about patents. Yes, and about SVG as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, a couple of good talks on that one. Okay, so you're going to join us throughout the rest of the show and uh, pitch in and help out and just be generally useful. Yeah. Um, so I, that's it, isn't it? I think so. Let's get on with it. Last year, there was uh, a code sample uploaded which uh, fixed a bug to a particular bug on Launchpad. The uh, the details of the bug aren't particularly important, but what was interesting was the uh, response which came from both uh, Mark Shuttleworth and Matthew Paul Thomas. Um, the person submitting the bug had submitted a, a code thing saying, look, here's, a, here's an example of something I sh- I'm trying to do in a user interface. And... Um, the suggestions were that he should have implemented it using a, a UI mock-up, mock-up tool or Inkscape or the GIMP or something like that. And um, I was one of the, I was quite curious as to whether this was a, a, a good thing to tell a developer um, because it, it seems a little bit counterintuitive to suggest that developers should um, be using graphical tools when that's perhaps not where their expertise are. Now, Mark, you're a developer. Um, uh, what's your initial gut reaction to this sort of thing? Well, my initial reaction would be you should use whatever's quickest for you. It shouldn't matter, you know, if someone else thinks you should use a tool because it's what they would use if you're mm. quicker doing it in code. I mean, like when I write presentations now, I'm, I use an HTML-based thing and code it all by hand right? because I, it's quicker for me to do that and get it right than it is for me to use something like OpenOffice and drag it all and resize all the text. Right, okay. Um, but that's just you using that. You haven't got to, other people haven't necessarily got to peer review that and before oh, well, the maybe, point of presentation maybe play around with it and do, yeah. do other things to it yeah i mean it seems like you know if, if your strength is obviously like a, as a developer is, is coding yeah and if you're able to knock up a proof of concept in code um to to show what it is you're trying to do why should you have to use something like the gimp would you be offended if somebody said go and use the gimp to do this otherwise i'm not interested if someone yeah if someone said go and use the gimp otherwise i'm not interested i would be quite offended if someone suggested i used it i might think about doing it next time right but, um i mean reading the way that the uh the responses were posted on launchpad it seems you know uh, i mean mark actually says if you think i'm out of line think again basically <laughs> get him told yeah 
Yeah. Okay. Well, Laura, what, what, from your point of view, because obviously it's not just technical people who are reviewing bugs or feature requests or something like this these days. Um, I think the basic principle of the thing, they're right. Um, well, they're right to say... That you should be mocking it up. Right. Um, because while it is a case of what you're good at and what you're used to, doing something in code... I mean, this particular one may have been a very simple thing to do anyway, but mm. in general... Doing something in code isn't the equivalent of doing a mock-up for a designer. Because once it's in the code, even if it's not technically the case, psychologically, it's a point where there's more commitment. So then you've got to roll it out again, as opposed to... I mean, the only reason they're saying do it on um, GIMP or something is because you've got to be able to share it with remote people. I mean, I have this problem at work. It's Mm. so much actually better if you just sketch it with a pen and paper. It's so much less commitment. It takes two minutes. Um, But, I mean, you can use things like Balsamic, which is what I use, and I think MPT mentioned using. Okay, so what's what's Balsamic? It's a mock-up tool, so it's got lots of little windows, like sketched-out windows and checkboxes and things. You just drag and drop onto a canvas to um, build up an interface. Or what, in this particular case, what would have probably been easiest is just to take a screenshot and then create a fake icon and drop it onto the screenshot. And this would be using, say, GIMP or equivalent of Paint or something. Yeah, and, and, but that's the thing is that you wouldn't necessarily inherently expect a developer to have those skills. And suggesting that they should go away and, and learn the GIMP or whatever, rather than doing what may be quicker for them, which is a quick code patch and an experiment. I suspect part of the problem here is that, I mean, I personally wouldn't want to use the GIMP either um, because it is a pain to use. I, if we had a, if there was an equivalent of um, paint, I'd possibly use that. Right. Um, but probably the easiest thing is just to take a screenshot and shot and drop it into OpenOffice presentation. And I mean, this would have been two screenshots overlaid one on top of the other. Hmm. And that for anybody, I mean, most people know how to use an office package to that level. And again, it's just using whatever tools is easiest. I personally wouldn't, as I say, use GIMP or Inks, Inks, Inkscape. Inkscape, yeah can't even say it so (laughs) um but you know there's always something there that's easy enough to do Uh, even if it was sketching it on paper and then scanning it in yeah and if you're if somebody is submitting ideas to you as code snippets you presumably need to take that compile it and then run it in some side some sort of test environment and we all know that compiling something get all the libraries (laughs) and dependencies right can be a pain if it's a particularly complex piece of software which as perhaps as a non-technical person but somebody who is experienced in user interface design or whatever it might be um you haven't got the 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 time necessarily to do that so it isn't it's just a case of it's quicker for the developer to do that to uh to knock up the code actually there is a, a a bigger burden of time perhaps elsewhere yeah I think there's also a point of ownership as well in that Mm. the design team is meant to own the look and feel of this sort of thing and MPT in this case had had specified what the thing was to look like and the developer had made a decision for good reasons but not as part of the overall design um, with knowing where the design was going and what it was doing and things and had just made that change and hadn't, I think if he'd just made it as a mock-up again, it's not got that kind of commitment into the code. Whereas as he'd done it into the code, it was seen as a, you know, what's ha- what happens if everybody does this and everybody changes something and nobody really notices? Or Yeah, but it, it's it's uh, for the developers, the geeky, geeky monk members of you, it was a subversion branch. So it wasn't in like the main code for the thing. It, had, it was the option to, to merge it in later. Um, but it was something you could test and try out. It wasn't in the main the main part of the uh, code. Yeah, that's true. So that's something that Subversion does give you, is the ability to, to do branches and to do experimental bits of, of code. That's one of the reasons you might choose to use that rather than some of the other version control systems. But I don't know whether whether that really represents much more of a commitment. I mean, it's just a branch. You could throw it away, couldn't you, Mark? You could, but once you've... If, if you are branching something and changing something, it's generally because that's the way you want it to go in the future. Whereas if you are, I suppose, just mocking it up, mm. then it is... What I've found, because I've started using mock-ups a lot more recently, I did used to just, when, when I was designing a screen or an interface, I used to mock it all up in HTML. Right. But then I've now started using mock-ups, and you'll find that people are a lot less squeamish about saying what they think, really. What if, right. it's, if it doesn't look like you've spent all of your time on it 
Oh. Um, then, you know, if, like, for instance, balsamic, everything yeah. looks like it's sketched with a pencil. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, <laughs> I couldn't sketch that. Even though, you know, it takes literally minutes to just drag and drop user interface things right. onto the screen. And, yeah, it looks like you've sketched it with a pencil in five minutes and people aren't then afraid to say, what if we move this here? What if we move mm. this here? Whereas, right. I suppose if you code it all up and then they say, what if you move this here? Then you have to go back to the code and change it and then give it back to them. Whereas if it's just a mock-up, you just drag it do or you, they can maybe drag it themselves if it's in something simple which you know it's a nice easy interface then they can just move it and say do you think it looks better there so do you use balsamic for your mock-ups i do now yeah right and that's is that for web stuff as well as um, yeah gui yeah. users yeah. gui apps yeah i mean i've i've um uh i've i started using it for sort of web app mock-ups but then i started using it for web design mock-ups as well right because it's sort of, I mean, it's all the same thing in the end of the day. Yeah. So, so do you do you ever feel reluctant to make a change if you, when you were doing more full mockups and somebody said, "Oh, could it be this slightly different in some way?" And you think, "Oh, actually, to do that, I'm going to have to shuffle quite yeah, a lot of code." Yeah, no, that, I go, did. That was that was yeah. my mindset. Once I started actually coding something, I thought I'll code it the way that I think it will be in the end. And right. then, you know, if I if I was coming up with several possible designs, I'd always spend more time on the one I liked more. And then less time on the ones which I thought were go- were ones that I wasn't going to push, sort of thing. Right. Okay. Whereas That's quite if, interesting. If I was, if I'm just creating a mock up, I can just create a sort of a template and then have several different versions of it very easily, and change them and make more pretty easily as well. And that's you doing de- designs development from your own designs, mostly. Yes. Yeah. I mean, one thing I think I find is that if a developer just code something up even if it's just to show me it kind of excludes me from the process and right. i don't claim to be anything like as a designer like mpt is um but i do do some ui design as part of my job hmm. and if i've mocked something up and then someone goes away and implements it i'm quite happy for them to come back and say oh yeah i think this should be different or whatever that's fine but if they just mock it if they just implement it completely differently it's like well what's my part in this process and then it's a lot it is harder to ask them it's not just harder to persuade them it's harder to actually ask them to change it because you know that it's a bit more committed and is it really worth the hassle of convincing them and stuff Um, do do you ever get anybody sort of saying sort of doing the classic going (laughs) (laughs) i could could change that now but it'll be such a lot of work exactly and you start to preempt it as well you look at it and go that's going to take them a bit of effort to fix. Is it really worth the effort of the argument and mm. this sort of thing? Mm. So it kind of it stops the design getting that kind of peer review and discussion and stuff. And the thing is, um, I was working with a developer last year who he his tendency was just to dive straight in and did, um, implement whatever it was he was doing, like a dialogue, and it was really simple dialogue. Yeah. And I sort of turned around and said, "Okay, so what are you going to put in it before he started?" And he's like, "Oh." not actually sure it's like right here's a paper here's a pencil draw it and he sat there and he's probably spent about 10 minutes thinking about it then because he had to and he thought of all these different issues and we sat and looked at it and we still came up with other pro- came up with other problems right because he'd sketched it and i was able to look at it before it actually went into the code and it was really valuable and i think he got the point at that point he doesn't always do it but <laughs> <laughs> do, do you think people or sorry do you think developers sometimes deliberately implement something more fully in code because it means that either it negates the argument or it it somehow if they get to make their decisions they're the ones writing the code and they can perhaps ignore you to a certain extent um i'm not sure that they do it as a manipulative way like that so much as they might be trying to just prove what they're trying to show to themselves as much as anything right but then get into the code so far that it then becomes difficult to pull it back out mm. again hmm oh, that, that's 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 quite interesting i mean it you, you're not entirely disagreeing with each other but there's a little bit of a a variation there's obviously our developers out there who feel that i'd much rather write a quick you know 20 line patch to try something out than than develop a a, a, a balsamic mock-up or something um I wonder what all of our listeners think about that. Um, perhaps, perhaps if you're a developer and you uh, have 
experience of being told to go and do something in the gym or balsamic or alternatively you th- you think mocking up a few lines of, of code is the right way to do it um send us a, an email or via any of the other message uh, other methods that we'll talk about at the end of the show but you can email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org And now it's time for the news. Despite computing careers being considered as top jobs in America now, numbers of computer science graduates, male and female, have decreased since 2000. Numbers of women computer science graduates are decreasing faster than men, though. Oh, go on, Laura. This is, again, another opportunity for you to speak as a spokesman for your people. For my or people. spokesperson for, <laughs> for your my people, people. I should say, yeah. Um, what's that all about, then? Is that worrying, isn't it? Yeah, it was something to do with, I think, for men... It had decreased by 70% and women by 80%. Wow. So, yeah, um, I think the well, there was the article itself was all about the facts, but there was a link off to an opinion piece relating to it. And they were just saying that it's not encouraged as a, a girly thing. There's a huge emphasis now on girls being girly when they're little. And they're encouraged to be communicators. So use technology for communicating like Facebook, Twitter, right. whatever but not for actually finding out the guts of it. And I think that's a general problem across boys and girls, but more so with girls. Isn't that why they introduced the high-tech Barbie or whatever? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) A bit like Pink Lego. Right. It's it's a while for the people who play Mm. with that Barbie to get through to university, I suppose. Yeah. So 2025 will all be fine. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And now some legal type stuff. Uh, A manufacturer of embedded Linux devices is suing another company for modifying the firmware on those devices. The worrying part is that only parts modified are licensed under the GPL. Should this case be successful, there are bad implications for hardware hackers. Yeah, that's a a little bit of a worrying thing, because, okay, um, the GPL doesn't get rid of your legal rights over code, but they've taken GPL code, released it, and somebody else has modified it, and now they're suing them for modifying it, which is just totally against the, the content. Yeah. I can't think why they would even think that was right, but sillier things have happened in court, I suspect. Yes, and are happening at the moment. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. But it's another, I guess, well, it's not a patent, this one, is it? I was going to say it's another shot in the patent law, but... It's no, not. it's just, it's trying to enforce GPL, I guess, as much as anything. Well, what, we're trying not... No, the people defending yeah. are trying oh, yes. to enforce yeah. the GPL. Yeah, okay. Automatic, who originally registered the WordPress trademark when the company was a startup, has transferred the trademark to the WordPress Foundation. Founding developer Matt Mullenweg, or Mullenweg possibly, wants to the, wants the trademark to be protected in the event, say, of Automatic being run by less benevolent people than it is now. I wonder what prompted that. Yeah, I, I don't know whether he's still he works for Automatic, but he obviously has, you know. I couldn't quite tell. To to I think so, but there were other people on the board, um, but they all dis- they all agreed. Okay, fair enough. The first version of Linux Mint Debian Edition has been released, and previous releases of Mint have all been based on Ubuntu, whereas this one's based on Debian testing. Okay. Has anybody tried it? No. 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 (laughs) Good luck to them. WeTab Internet Tablet will run the Linux-based Mego operating system instead of the previous Ubuntu-based OS. This apparently improves the battery life and overall performance. The user interface will still look the same and will still run the same range of apps, including Android apps. Another thing not using Ubuntu anymore. Yeah, it's a bit of a downer to end the news on, isn't it? Yeah. Quick, somebody say something interesting. No pressure. (laughs) (laughs) Let's have some events. They're much more interesting. On Friday the 17th of September 2010, Fossbox are running a sustainable ICT event as part of Software Freedom Day. Um, They're having tea and coffee and you can drop in and find out about you know, how to make computing more green and sustainable, I guess. So if you're in the area, which is St. Catherine's Way in London, why not drop along and have some tea? Our spy camp is on the 25th and 26th of September in Dublin. Yes, and I was going to say we're going, but of course, out of the three of us, I'm the only one that is going. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm going, and so's Alan, and so's Dave, so we're going to do a live show there. Um, Ospar Camp website is up with a timetable of events, and all of us are doing a talk as well as doing the live show. Come along, it's going to be brilliant. See you in Dublin, and buy me uh, a drink. Uh, Ubuntu App Developer Week is happening on September the 27th through to October the 1st of 2010. Uh, this is formally op- uh, Ubuntu Opportunistic Developer Week, which is a week aimed at encouraging people to get involved in making apps for Ubuntu which scratch their itches. Ooh, that's good. 
Well done for reading that in, by the way. You got a prize for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that's uh, that is a. It's been one of those. That's one of the. Uh, uh, mm, what's the the, the Jono, Jono's thing that he developed coming up with that little code snippet? Let's learn it. I can't think of the name of it. Uh, quickly, quickly. That's the one. So that's part of one of the things he did as part yeah. of that scratching your own itches thing. Um, but yeah, so if you've got a little project you want to get off the ground, it's a good opportunity to get it started. On the line now is Andrew Waffer from the Open Sousa community. How are you doing, Andrew? Uh, not too bad, thanks. Sorry, Charles. Yeah, not too bad. Now, you're a, a, a very special person because we interviewed you originally, I think back in the very first episode of this podcast. Yes, that's quite correct. I believe it was Fosdem. Yeah, it was. Stood in yeah. a very windy corridor, if I remember correctly. Yes, yourself and Davey. Yeah, those were the days. <laughs> we've, learnt, we've learnt a lot since then. <laughs> Um, but you're going to talk to us today about Open Sousa, the Open Sousa community. Now you've got a conference coming up, is that right? Yes, that's correct. It's our um, our second Open Sousa conference. Uh, it's similar, I, I suppose, to Ubuntu's UDS. Okay. Um, where it's predominantly aimed at developers and contributors, um, but uh, we do also look at you know users uh, and such like. Um, so that's happening in uh, the home of uh, Open Seas, which is, uh, of course, Nuremberg. Uh, the conference is... It's a, there are some informal aspects to it, um, but there are also uh, you know, scheduled tracks. Um, OK. So with Novell being a, a fairly large contributor to uh, Open Office. Um, we've also got a dedicated open office track uh, with a lot of the guys from the Go OO project, um, which is predominantly the version of open office that distributions use. Um, certainly Ubuntu, Fedora, OpenSUSE, uh, even Debian, they all use the, the build from the Go OO project um, as the restrictions for merging of patches and features etc aren't as um, strict as upstream open office it's kind of a, it's not necessarily a fork of open office it's kind of a staging tree right um, if you want um, but we've got all sorts of different tracks uh, we've got an ed- education track um, there's uh, business uh, overseas and build service um, which for, for those that aren't aware is a, a web-based service uh, which also has a command line utility for building uh, packages for various distributions um, obviously OpenSUS is supported throughout the versions SUS Enterprise is supported Fedora is supported as is Ubuntu uh, Debian uh, and Mandriva um, so from you know using one tool you can package for multiple distributions all in one hit. It's in the same sort of way as, as Ubuntu's PPAs are with Launchpad. Um, there isn't necessarily the same integration with the build service from other open source tool sets yet as there is with Launchpad. Um, but that's uh, on its way sort of thing. But I mean that's one of the things that gets discussed and, and things hammered out at, at the conference. So it's mainly like a working conference. Is it a full week? Um, it's from the 20th to the 23rd inclusive of October. Um, it is a working conference, but it's also a, a very social conference. Um, a chance for developers to meet. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of the time, you know, with a, an open source project, especially like a distribution, you never really get to meet in person a lot of people uh, that actually work on it. Um, so it's a great time for, for people from various parts of the project to, to get together and, and have a chat over a beer and, and you know, throw some code around. So yeah, it's, it's, I mean, we've got people from Fedora and Debian uh, doing presentations uh, this year. All oh, right. Um, it's... Uh, this year's actually got a bit of a theme. It's collaboration across borders. Um, so it, it's open to all members of open source, mm. not just open uh, And we, you know, actively encourage other members of, 
you know, different distribution to come and join the fun and, and chat and see where we can, you know, where the synergies are, how we can work better together, um, you know, common issues that we hit. So what sort of things might, might they be? What things would a, an Ubuntu developer maybe get from going to an OpenSUSE conference? Uh, we, um, from an Ubuntu perspective, I mean, there's various things, for instance, like we've got the education track going on. So it's, you know, getting the Ubuntu guys and the OpenSUSE education guys together, seeing how um, we can promote better, um, not just open source or Linux, but the, the various tool sets that each distribution rolls out for, for the education aspect of things. Mm. Um, where upstream guys can, you know, chat to various distribution maintainers and, and vice versa. Um, so kind of taking snippets from the likes of Guadec and, and Academy and being able to fine-tune it somewhat rather than being a more general upstream that there are elements of, of downstream consumerism but also I mean last year we had um, some of the zeitgeist uh, developers okay was um, it safe lot v and people like that yeah safe lot who was there and or sorry uh, should I say Steve lofty as he likes to be called now how <laughs> does he right okay um, but yeah they, they were there and they were hacking through until you know two in the morning uh, in the Vale office um, doing what, you know, all sorts of bits and bobs but from an Ubuntu perspective it, it's certainly it, it's one for the Ubuntu community to come and meet the OpenSUSE community and vice versa hmm. um, I was hoping to be able to try and get round to UDS earlier when it was in Brussels hmm. um, unfortunately work got in the way um, <laughs> but it's just nice to, to see our you know, colleagues and, and peers Yeah. Uh, and just you know, informally chat. I mean, there, there's no real animosity, and yes, we we might be jealous of your um, meteoric growth. But <laughs> other than that, it's all you know, all good. Is it, I was going to um, sort of compare and, and contrast the Ubuntu community and the OpenSUSE community a little bit because it, it's not an entirely dissimilar model. I mean, we have Canonical who supports the development of Ubuntu and obviously Novell supports the uh, development of SUSE and, and, and OpenSUSE. But can you sort of describe the relationship between Novell and the SUSE products and the OpenSUSE part of it? Yeah, I mean, unlike um, Ubuntu where it has you know, standard six-month um, releases uh, and every so often you have a, a long term release which is mm. effectively the, the, the enterprise version or, or what canonical pushes for um, people to, to pay for um, historically SUSE as was was a, a relatively closed community um, I mean it, you couldn't download SUSE for free you had to pay for a box set to get the disc right. when Ubuntu started, they, I mean, from my perspective anyhow, it's obvious that they looked at how Red Hat, how, you know, Novell and Sousa and, and whatnot worked, mm. and they, you know, cherry-picked what they thought would work best, um, and obviously having a, an open community from the outset um, was the right way to go, and, and Novell realised this and, and subsequently started opening up the community they changed the SUSE product for consumers to open SUSE right. uh, they kept the SUSE name on its own for their enterprise product, the SUSE Linux Enterprise which has both a, a dedicated server and desktop mm -hmm. variant um, that's based on um, a release of OpenSUSE, generally the, the dot one release of OpenSUSE. Um, currently OpenSUSE is sitting on uh, 11.3 um, as it stands now. Um, we just recently um, fixed our release cycle to an eight month release cycle. Okay. Um, there were various reasons and a long discussion, public discussion about it. Um, what were the reasons for going for that? That it was a matter of trying to, to not necessarily please everyone because if you try and please everyone you'll ultimately <laughs> please nobody um, it was trying to, to 
bring in uh, not just the, the latest and greatest, but also an element of stability. Um, there are times when rolling with six-month cycles, yes, you can have the latest uh, upstream gnome in there and whatnot, but you've not necessarily had a chance to apply um, that little bit of stability to it, so you still get all the, the rough edges and warts and all with it. Um, and Susie's traditionally been a, a fairly rock-steady um, distribution with, with few or as few bugs as possible. Obviously, every distribution aims to do that, but there were, there were elements. I mean, Fedora historically was always so bleeding edge you'd end up slicing a finger off at the same <laughs> um, And uh, there were elements of Ubuntu where, again, it was too shiny and all, you know, you're blind and you can't quite see. You soon mm. had, the, had that same issue as well. Uh, I mean, we went we never really had a fixed release cycle. So there were times when we would release in six months and it was quite painful. And there were other times when we had uh, you know, an eight, nine month cycle uh, before the next version was released and that was absolutely rock solid. Um, so it, it's a matter of trying to get the best of both worlds of stability and nice new shiny stuff uh, to please the majority you're never going to please everyone so you know we accept that so what do you think uh, attracts people to SUSE over any of the other Linux distributions oh we've got probably one of the best mascots in, in Linux I was that's just going to say that <laughs> <laughs> I mean that, that, that's the that's the easiest thing so we, we do genuinely have uh, one of the coolest mascots ever uh, our dearly beloved Geeko Mm. Um, and you know, at conferences, whenever you know we've got a stall there, we, we tend to have as, as many soft, cuddly geekos as possible, and we tend to go like hotcakes. I picked mm. one up at Og Camp, in fact. Yeah, me and all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we tend to try and have to end up rationing them, um, <laughs> otherwise we'll, we'll be out within the first day, sort of. <laughs> but it, it's quite a tough one. I mean, it, it's we we've got a, a pretty solid backbone uh, from an infrastructure perspective. Yes, there's always improvements, but nine times out of ten uh, we've got a lot of the tool sets out there for people. Um, we are a, relatively speaking a young community in the same sense as Ubuntu's community and Fedora's community um, because we started having an open community mm. after everyone. Um, so we are still learning to an extent, um, you know, we're trying not to copy what Ubuntu and Fedora and you know Debian have done. Uh, we're trying to bring our own um, flavour to it. Mm -hmm. There are times when we do have to just, you know, admit, you know, uh, why try and reinvent the wheel? You know, somebody yeah. else has done it. It's great. Let's just run with it. Um, we we'll always get heretics going, you know, <laughs> screaming abuse at you. But hey ho, um, that's one of the things. But you know, we're young, effervescent. Um, we are actually quite welcoming. Um, <laughs> Only quite? Well, you have to bear in mind that it, Sousa is traditionally a, a, a German, or its origins are in Germany, um, and the Teutonic mannerisms do sometimes eke out. Right. It's okay, we're not fab. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it, you know, it, some people get the wrong gist of the stick. Yeah. Um, but that, I think you always get that when it's just an online-based communication. Mm. Um, oh, yeah. And bearing in mind English isn't necessarily everyone's native language. Um, it can be a bit awkward at times, but generally speaking, we're, we are loving, uh, friendly people. Um, <laughs> we, we love all members. Uh, and we don't discriminate too much. Uh, um, do you so yeah, it's, it's it, there's all sorts of things. I mean, the 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 build service provides a, a great way for people to to learn packaging, um, not just for OpenSUSE but for other distributions. Okay, we don't necessarily have the same uh, expertise in, for instance, Debian packaging mm. as Ubuntu's uh, Motus do. Um, 
but you know we, we've got tool sets there and we would love you know for, for some of the mighty guys to come in and you know teach us how how to do better debian packaging how to use app, you know the tool to its fullest extent for upstream projects so you know using something like uh, the build service you can provide packages for almost every distribution you want providing uh, yum repositories for fedora providing repositories for empty and you know debian repositories as well also with, with the build service you can actually host your own instance you don't have to use open um, it's completely open source um, codes out there there are packages for, for all the distributions to be able to you know to install it so when is the next release for the build service the 2.2 I forget off the top of my head when that's due out that's not too far in the future actually now um, the other uh, thing that the build service does is also integrate with SUSE Studio for building of uh, appliances uh, and virtual machines and whatnot. Um, so, if a package is in on the build service, uh, you can just add that repository to the nice shiny um, web front end that SUSE Studio provides, and you can create your own custom distribution based on OpenSUSE as the base layer. But that would be about it, and, and you can add almost any application you wish. Um, and it sort of spits out an ISO at the end, doesn't it, or a USB bootable, yeah, bootable image? USB, a, a VMware image, a, a virtual box image, whatever you want, um, and you can then just grab it from there. You don't have to know any command line right. or through your web browser, be it Firefox, Chrome, Opera, um, whatever. So it's completely OS agnostic from a building perspective. Okay. Um, and at the end of the day, you've got something that, you know, if you just want to test, uh, you know, have, have a, a recovery image mm. or, you know, an antivirus image or whatever you wish, you can do it all from there. Uh, and there's, uh, there's all sorts of things. I mean, there, there's uh, one person's created a, a web developer's virtual machine where it has most of the web browsers out there. Uh, so including Internet Explorer, Safari, um, Android's own web browser, uh, Firefox, right. Chrome, different versions of the browsers as well. Right. Um, so if you want to test your web app in browsers, you can just fire up a VM, one VM which has all those browsers in there. Mm. Uh, right. And that's created on, on Suze Studio. That's quite cool. Hmm. So you were saying earlier about the um, eight-month cycle being fixed. When's the next release of OpenSUSE? Uh, OpenSUSE 11.4 is due for release in March. And what kind of things are sort of the big hitters in that release? Obviously, Not that we're trying uh, to find the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on the timing of um, GNOME and KDE's releases, uh, we try and, and fit the latest in. Um, so only two seconds. I'll just get the, uh, the announcement up for. We just released our first milestone for 11.4 um, at the beginning of the month. Is the, is the numbering convention similar to Ubuntu's, or does 11.4 mean it's, it's 2011? It's, or no, it's, it's not really the same as right. Ubuntu, um, where you've got the year and month sort of thing. Mm. As is fairly arbitrary. I mean, I forget what version Ubuntu. I mean, I started using Ubuntu when it's 6.2 back in 2000, I think it was. 11.4 is going to be the last of the 11 series, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, around November time, November December time uh, next year will be 12.0. Okay. Um, and then around August September, it's going to be 12.1, which will then uh, give birth to Suzy Linux Enterprise 12. Right, okay. Um, and then so on and so forth. I mean, originally we used to only just go up to dot three, 
in the release versioning scheme. So technically this current release, 11.3, would have been our last of the 11 series. And then we'd go on to the 12. Um, but due to us fixing our, our cycles, mm -hmm. um, we've got an extra one in here to be able to ensure that the enterprise version marries up nicely with, with what the community version is doing. All oh, right, so they'll be in sync from now on, will they? Yeah, exactly. Right, okay. Well, I, I suppose we need to wrap up now. So quickly, where can people f go if they want to get involved with either the open source community or they're perhaps interested in coming along to the conference? Uh, for the conference, if you go to conference.opensusie.org, uh -huh. um, that will... Uh, got links there to the schedule and to register uh, in attendance. Uh, we asked people to register just so we've got a rough idea of, of numbers, hmm. make sure that we've got enough goodie bags, etc. for people. Okay. Um, oh, there are goodie bags. No, I like the sound of that. Uh, <laughs> you might even be lucky enough to get a good old uh, cuddly geek <laughs> um, and for, for general open Susie bits, if you go to www.opensusie.org, um, the landing page there has links to various um, parts of the project right. uh, for involvement. Mm -hmm. um, on IRC, um, if you're a, a GNOME, go to uh, opensuzy gnome on Freenode and uh, dash KDE if that's your flavour. Um, and uh, for general opensuzy project related things and, and questions, if you go to opensuzy project on Freenode, uh, ask a question there and uh, a helpful uh, lads and lasses all point you in the right direction excellent well thank you very much indeed for taking the time to talk to us this evening and uh, we hope the conference is a success thank you very much Take thank care. you cheers bye. bye it's time for everybody's favourite the bit about Ubuntu Gerald oh who's that Hello. <laughs> who's that noise on you the you can't keep me away it's Alan joining us on the telephone just to correct us about the title of the segment. <laughs> How you doing, Al? You right? Yeah, not bad, not bad. Sorry I can't be there with you, family illness and all that. Oh, bless. I can be there in spirit. And, uh, indeed, in you voice. You missed the cake. Yeah. What cake have you got? Toffee. Oh. Toffee little crispy bits on top, and it's very oh. nice. And we're having to eat, you know, a quarter as much again each, because there's only three people here. <laughs> I thought you were, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is in the uh, ecosphere this time? Well, first of all, um, we've got the new font. Oh, um, yes. There's a nice bug that's been reported by a friend of the show, Alan Bell, mm -hmm. um, about the inclusion of that font family in um, Maverick 1010 that comes out next month. Because it's supposed to be in there, isn't it? And it isn't. Well, there was kind of an idea that it might be, but it's not really ready yet. Was it, was oh. it, wasn't that the original pitch, though, that it was going to be widely used in, in Ubuntu? I think so, but um, I think it, the fact that it's not really ready in lots of different languages. I mean, there's right. obviously English um, uh, standard, but there's also bold and a few other bits and bobs, and it's n and it's not finished. You know, right. it's, it's not even publicly available yet. It's still only available to um, Ubuntu members and selected groups who are interested, like people who are doing artwork or screenshots and stuff right. like that. So it's really a case of, stop, this font is not ready yet. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> yeah. So it's things like some of the foreign characters and, and what have you are fully implemented. Lots of the foreign characters. Uh, you know, all the um, kanji and um, other Far Eastern languages. Klingon. Anything, anything non-Latin, basically. Right, okay. So are they going to get it done in time, or is it not going to appear, or is it going to be partly implemented? Not sure. I think they might put it in and um, not make it the default. Might be a might be a wise idea, so it gets more right. use. Um, at least then you know, more people will have access to it. Presumably it's just a case of designer time to get all the relevant uh, yeah. glyphs done. And and as uh, Dave said, when he went to the Canonical HQ to talk to them about it, um, they did say they want community involvement to help um, develop the font. Help finish it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, fair enough. Okay, so um, well, the next thing on the item is, is from the technical board, I think. Yeah, okay, so this is to do with the uh, Ubuntu Brainstorm, where people can suggest either weird, wonderful, wacky, or actually quite sensible ideas that they'd like to see in Ubuntu, and people can vote it up and down. Um, and there's going to be a sort of formal process for evaluating those things uh, in, in two stages within the release cycle. Um, one just after UDS, and one some other time that I can't quite see off the top of my head. Um, oh yeah, near, near the first beta. Um, so... 
is this going to be a good way for people to get their ideas in? Is it actually going to help? Does this mean that people haven't been looking at the uh, brainstorm for a while? Well, that was, that was something we, we talked about way back in the very first episode. We did. And um, one of the concerns we had at the time was, was anyone going to look at this? You know, is it just yeah. a, a way for people to vent their spleen and say, someone should fix this, and um, no one actually ever look at it? And there is an argument that the developers don't actually look at it. Does that mean, quite shockingly, that we could have been right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't want to push it that far. Yeah, right, OK. But, yeah, we are. Um, and, and so I think it's a good idea if they're going to, you know, pick the cream of the crop and at least focus some attention on some of them. Otherwise, it's a completely wasted exercise, really. Yeah, it would certainly be good to see some of those ideas coming into it. I mean, there are some genuinely innovative ideas. And... If, even if the, the, idea, the top ideas aren't that innovative, they are clearly a way for people to indicate their frustrations or their particular um, needs or desires. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was chatting with Dave about this the other day, and I think he might, or one of us may have said something along the lines of, do you know of any feature that's in Ubuntu now that started life as an idea on Brainstorm? And right. Neither of us could think of one. Hmm. Okay, well, that's a little bit of a damning indictment, isn't it? But yeah. maybe that will change, and maybe this time next year we'll be able to look back and and, uh, and see lots of features. Or yeah, let's hope so. Three or four, anyway. Okay, next up, Laura. Um, there's been a book raised about Ubiquity, the um, Ubuntu installer. Okay, what's the bug? Because it no longer includes an option to set a computer name. <sighs> Yeah, they kind of. It's, it's not just that actually. There's a few things. I, I I plop this one in there because there's a few things about Ubiquity. It's been really streamlined. It looks really nice now. I mean, yeah. it looked nice anyway with the nice slideshow as you install. But now it asks you less questions and actually starts installing fewer questions before you've even <laughs> finished. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it starts inst- writing stuff to disk. Yeah. While you're still setting your user details. Yeah, before you've even told it your name and password and all that kind of stuff. Normally, you know, most installers traditionally ask you a bunch of questions, and then yeah. at the end they give you a summary, yeah. and you press a button to say go, and it does it. And you go and have a cup of tea and come back, and it's exactly. done. Exactly. But this, and this kind of scared me a bit, um, because I know installing on some hardware, you, there are certain tweaks you need to make in the very last screen, like where do you install the bootloader, and it kind of freaks me out a little bit. Mm. But it had already started installing before it even asked me where I want to put the bootloader. And I thought, oh, hello. Uh, I'm a bit worried about this. So I canned it. And, uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> and I must admit, I, there have been times where I've kind of got through the installer just for testing purposes or something and, you know, had, had never intended to actually install the, the thing. Yeah. Um, and if it started to do that behind the scenes, it could have been a bit problematic. Mm. But well, more, more importantly, this means that people can't name their machines something weird, wonderful, and, and wacky. It will only na- name the machine, whatever your username is, dash desktop. Which, which if will... you've got more than one on the same network. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. That's Especially not if you're the good. guy who, or the girl, who installs every machine. <laughs> You know, and you're yeah. the first user ID that's created, then all your machines yeah. have the same name. Or your, or your cloning machines if you're running a big network. Yeah. And it'll entirely break our uh, home naming convention. Which is? Doctor Who Buddies. Ah, <laughs> <excellent>. <laughs> yeah, that's the main reason why they can't do it. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's why it's a critical bug. Mm. Actually, its importance is set to low. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, uh, okay, if yeah, people who only got one laptop then oh sorry only one device then yeah fair enough but there are a lot of people who will have more than one on a network and they will want to use the same username on that more than one device yeah um it seems it's, a, it's, a, it's certainly a, uh, not an unreasonable thing to expect you to be able no. to have a, a button somewhere to get to those advanced settings if if host name is an advanced setting yeah um and apparently some of the some of these things are hidden away in a kind of advanced menu but I think you have to pass ubiquity some command line parameter or something. I don't, I don't mm. quite know how you get to that, and it's not immediately obvious from the user interface, which is lovely and has been cleaned up, but it's not immediately obvious how to get how you get to those hidden things. Right. Yeah. So it's becoming more of a case of if you want the advanced things, you've got to go with the um, the alternate installer, which is all n curses based. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that, I guess. Well, no, I know it's, it's, there's not necessarily anything wrong with that, but it's not as nice, is it? You don't want to have to download a different no, install image just because you want the other options that's which fair. are in there. Especially when the, the only CD you get from Ship It is a yeah. live CD. Yeah, that's true as well. Yeah. 
Mm, and it could um, muck up things like uh, Avahi, the sort of auto discoverer stuff. Because if you went to a conference yeah. and you're called uh, Ben, and there's somebody else called Ben at the same conference, it would. What are the muck chances up of that? <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so uh, there are potential problems with that one. Okay, yeah. uh, Mark, what's the uh, the next one on the uh, on the list? Uh, the Ubuntu Deven- uh, Developers Manual is coming along nicely, which is uh, a manual for writing applications uh, b- about writing how tos and things like that. To um, I'm sure Pope can <laughs> tell us a bit more about it. Not well, yeah, it's it, it's exactly what you said. It's a developers manual to get people kick started on using Ubuntu as a development platform. So using that to write applications and games and, and what have you. And what you need to do around the code as well so that it'll actually be useful to people. Yeah. And, and also stuff like how you, how you package it and how you put it on Launchpad and distribute it and all that oh, kind right. of malarkey. You get but, it translated and stuff. Easily. Yeah, and make it translatable and all that kind of stuff. Not to be confused with the Ubuntu manual project. No, but it's actually developed by some of the same people. Um, okay. And they're using the same process. So the same, if, if you've... Um, if, if someone's contributed to the Ubuntu manual project, they need the same infrastructure, the same um, environment set up to contribute to this one as well. Right, okay. Um, I had to go at um, downloading all the necessary bits and bobs to compile the manual. Um, obviously, when it's released, it'll be released as a PDF. And, right. You, know, you can download and print it if you want to. But um, I decided to make it, and the instructions are pretty good. Um, unfortunately, you do need to use some packages that aren't in the repository, some newer versions um, of you know, the latex and all that kind of stuff. Um, But it's all really nicely documented on their website as to how you get all the environment running. So if anyone fancies having a go at helping um, with the uh, developer's manual, then uh, we'll put a link to uh, their project page on Launchpad. Do you reckon it'll make it easy for people to get started as developers in Ubuntu, or is it really for developers coming to Ubuntu and want to know about the idiosyncrasies of developing for that platform? I think a bit of both, really. Okay. Um, you know, it, it focuses on using quickly, so it's all about Python. So if you're a, a hardcore C programmer, um, it might not be as interesting. I think it's, it's a, if, if you think back to the, the days when, you know, we've talked about this before, when you used to get a computer that came with a programming language and when you turned it on, that's what you got, you know, like a Spectrum and a BBC. Um, well, we have that. We have Python, but we don't necessarily give people a manual like you used to get with a computer that tells you how to program it, like the Spectrum and the BBC had a book that came with it that told yeah. you how to program yeah. in BASIC, and we don't do that. Yet we have all the necessary development tools on the CD, an editor, um, you know, the interpreter, loads of libraries, everything to get going, but no way of letting people know how to get going. So do you think it might be something that will actually be on the CD itself? Um, I don't know. Um, there's no reason why it couldn't be in a future release, you know, once it's been right. um, through enough testing and plenty of people have had a go at it. But even if it wasn't on the CD, if it's a simple... You know, you could go to Lulu or whatever the website is where you yeah. can get it printed, or uh, maybe Canonical could sell them from the uh, the online store. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, and the next item is uh, a fantastic new experimental bug status of opinion, which uh, basically allows people to say that uh, not quite this is not a bug, but this is just a series of trolls. Not necessarily trolls. <laughs> No, I, I mean, yourself. A bit harsh. You know, you know how we sometimes get we get celebrity bugs that we sometimes link to. Yes. Where you know there's lots of discussion, no resolution, mm. nothing actually moving forward, but lots of people voicing their opinions or bike shedding, as they call it. Yes. Um, it's it's a way that a bug can be tagged so that developers possibly know not to spend too much time reading it and. <sighs> You know, because it's just full of people arguing, basically. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, that sounds like it could be an interesting uh, suggestion. In fact, in fact, most of the bugs we talk about would probably be potentially yeah. tagged up, is that? So actually, it's useful for us, because we can just do a set <laughs> based on that tag. Yeah. I did actually submit a bug recently, which probably could have done with that tag. Ah, what, straight from the outset? <laughs> yeah, had, had I known that that was there, I probably would have, uh, I probably would have tagged it myself. <laughs> Is there a little bit of a temptation for people just to tag bugs that they can't be bothered dealing with as opinion and then sort of dismiss them? Yeah, I think so, possibly. But but then you always have that with people tagging stuff as won't fix. Yeah. I suppose people could always invalid. re-tag it as something else. But Yeah. <laughs> then you could but, have a fight over that. Yeah. <laughs> but that tends to kind of get ironed out pretty quickly. You don't, I mean, there have been um, bugs. I can't remember which one it was. There was a, an Ubuntu 1 uh, it might have been either a Ubuntu One or a Music Store bug, 
where people kept reopening the bug mm. and one of the Ubuntu One developers kept closing it and saying, look, this is, this is how I manage my to-do list. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to you know, mark it as invalid or won't fix or whatever. You leave it alone because it's, in inverted commas, my bug. And I'm using this to track my work. And every time you reopen it, it pops up on my list. And you know, I, I don't want it to pop up on my list. Whereas people thought that when it was set as invalid or won't fix, that meant the developer was never going to look at it ever again. But in this particular case, it wasn't. So, so developers can get a bit um, precious about, <laughs> about their bugs. Uh, mm. Just the same as users can. Okay, fair enough. And Laura, what's the uh, the last item this time around? Um, so students in Argentina are going to be given a free netbook, and they get Ooh. the option of having Ubuntu or Windows Seven on it. Wow, that's pretty good news. Yeah. So they're giving away, I think, three million. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot of Ubuntu users potentially. potentially. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the question is, I guess, which nobody will know at this point, but is just how many are going to choose Ubuntu and how many are going to choose Windows? And how are they going to be told the difference between them? Because if it's yeah. free, if they've been given it, it's not like they've got to pay the extra uh, 80 tax. euros or whatever the, uh, the Windows tax is. So they're, uh, you know, <laughs> why would they choose Ubuntu if they've never heard of it? Well, there's plenty of reasons why you'd choose Ubuntu, isn't there? Well, on a netbook yeah but why would they choose Ubuntu that's the thing <laughs> yeah well there's plenty of reasons why we would yes yeah. yes yeah mm. are they, are they, they going to be given a leaflet saying you know these are your choices and here's how you can make an informed decision or are they just going to be told you can have what you know or you can have something else well yeah I mean again, I guess it depends on what these students are used to yeah uh, you know people can make informed decisions I guess you know it, it always reminds me of the the um the guys at Google, when they say new starters at Google, their people um, are offered um, Windows OS 10 or Linux, and if they ask for Linux, they get Ubuntu, and that means that, you know people there do choose it. Now, okay, a lot of them are engineers, but there's no reason to expect that some of these students won't be potential engineers and may well already have it oh, in no. their mind that they might want an Ubuntu laptop. But the trouble is it and the article that we're reading about it, the guy was ranting about the fact that um, we assume that people don't have free will to make choices. But I don't think it just comes down to that because if all your friends are running Windows, then you're going to have to have a specific reason why you're not running Windows. Or if you've only ever used Windows and you know somebody who can fix a Windows machine but not an Ubuntu machine, then you're probably going to go for Windows. So there's lots of reasons why it's not just about free choice. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll have to watch it and see in the future how many people did choose. Yeah. Yeah, but hopefully they will publish some stats. It would be really interesting to see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. And that's all in the bit about Ubuntu this time. It's time for your feedback, and we're going to start with something from Thomas Mashos, who emailed following our discussion about what we should call the home folder. I'm sure I'm not the only one with this idea, but wouldn't it be a better solution to not list the home folder at all? There are already links for the places menu for document in the places menu for documents, desktop, downloads, videos, music and pictures. For the average user, what else do they need access to? Advanced users would still know how to get to the home folder if necessary, and if anyone really wants to add the home folder back to the places menu or add any folder, it's easily done inside Nautilus with a simple click and drag. I think that's got quite a lot of merit to it. <laughs> it does, it? really. Yeah. I mean, if you are using the those folders, which I must admit kind of annoy me a bit, that it, it when you do an upgrade or something, it creates like half a dozen different folders. But if you are using them, then that's where all your stuff should be. You, why would you need to go to the top, le top level of your home folder? Yeah, my well, the top level of my home folder is just other folders. Right. Yeah. So I, I mean, I try to keep stuff organised. I do have a, I have a folder which is just a dump for everything, but I don't dump everything in my home folder. And it's probably good to encourage people not to dump everything yeah. in the home folder because mm. you've got all your settings in there as well. Yes. Yeah, That's and there's true. lots of dot, dot files dot hidden files, yeah. inside there that are automatically created. But again, generally people won't need to get access to them. But if they want to use an SSH key, they're probably clever enough to work out how to move them <laughs> yeah. using, using Nautilus or whatever. Yeah, okay, there's some, yeah, there's some merit to that one. I use KDE anyway, so it doesn't make a lot of difference to me. <laughs> <laughs> what does KDE do then? Um, KDE has, uh, on the panel 
it has i think it has a link to your i'm, I'm not sure you see i don't use the menus really i use um you use K-Runner. command line don't you well, <laughs> i use k runner which is the equivalent of gnome do basically right, okay uh, uh, yeah sort of the alt f2 write the right. command and so i type tilde and it comes up <laughs> or i type <laughs> or i type the name of the folder and it comes up so, right okay you know i uh uh, it doesn't really worry me what it's called because I know what it really is. Yeah, no, so that's, that's fair enough. All right, well, um, it's worth mentioning that Silna on Identity thinks that basically it should be just left alone. He's obviously happy with it being named three different things. Or it just doesn't care. Or just, <laughs> he's reaching that point. He just doesn't <laughs> care. Okie doke. Dave Carson heard us talking about the Ubuntu Stack Exchange in the last episode. Being a Stack Overflow user, I know how much better this type of Q&A site is than the standard forum model, so I decided to spread the word using Identica and Twitter. Within five minutes of my initial post on Identica, I got a a reply from a guy accusing me of spamming the Ubuntu channel. He said, You're advertising a QA and a site for Ubuntu outside of the official Ubuntu forums. This is bad for users, especially new ones, as they don't know how to look for help if there are thousands of sites advertised. It's one thing answering a user having a question with the site. It's another thing advertising these sites for general help for users as there's an official forum you did not advertise this site for anyone having an issue as you advertised it as a general thing for ubuntu which if more would make it would render the ubuntu forums useless so your advertisement is spam (laughs) in capital in capitals even though it's not an acronym Uh, as you advertise something (laughs) as you advertise something you may find useful in some ways but most users are confused of having thousands of sites to look after if they have problems well well done mark getting through that one um yeah there's there's a few interesting things to pick out pick up on that um one is that it's kind of the official ubuntu stack exchange yeah i that's what i understood i mean george castro phoned in and left us a message and he sort of endorsed it quite official He's quite official on, on, on good days. Um, <laughs> but I th- also there's this perception that that sort of site is 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 better. And that's quite an interesting uh, debate because I have seen plenty of forum posts where you've got a, somebody posting a question and somebody maybe makes a suggestion, if that, and then there's nothing else. Yeah. Or, or at least the original poster says, this doesn't solve my problem, but it doesn't get any more attention from anybody. But I've also seen posts on similar sort of Q&A sites which have the same problem somebody says this doesn't fix my problem or you get one perhaps yeah. semi-idiotic suggestion so I don't think there's anything inherently better about the Q- that sort of Q&A model um, I I don't know if it's just because the kind of person I am but I use Stack Overflow I've used it a lot for looking up answers just on Google right. but I use it to ask my own question for the first time a couple of weeks ago oh, okay. I found it really really straightforward I could, An, an Ubuntu exactly. question or something else? Uh, it was a well, it was partly Ubuntu, but general sort of programming okay. type question. And you know, I found it really straightforward to be able to ask my question, be able to categorize it correctly, and yeah, um, I got an answer pretty much straight away, which was useful as well. So, what is it that, that made you use that rather than posting to a forum? I think it's because I well, I'd used I, I'd read a lot of answers on there whenever i've been programming so right. i know that that's there's people there who are reading it who know what they're talking about yeah um and also because the topics there are really widely ranged uh but at the same time they're really tightly categorized right so you know that and you don't have to find the right place to post it you post it on the site and then you tag it okay and then it gets found by the right people but with a forum, you have to post your question in the right place. Exactly. Otherwise, someone flames you and says, yeah. ah, this doesn't belong here. And then a moderator right. moves it and then you can't find it again. <laughs> but the, the biggest uh, thing in both cases, though, is actually having an active community there that would answer the questions. Yeah. Whether you ask them in the right place exactly. or not. Exactly. So if we don't get Ubuntu people on the Ubuntu stack exchange, then Stuff it's going to be useless. Answered, yeah. yeah. I guess it's... Um, uh, you know, it is a new thing. So there may be people like this guy who was, you know, flaming Dave, um, who don't know that it's uh, it is out there and, and quite what it's for. Mm. They did also uh, ask an interesting question towards the end of his email about: Is it wrong to link to the Stack Exchange to people uh, to people's forum posts? Yeah, and I can see why he's a bit cautious about that. But um, I would if there was a good answer on Stack Exchange. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if it's good, cross-linking, if, then isn't it? If it's a specific answer, yes. But it, it, just saying, oh, if you haven't had an answer to your question yeah, here, try yeah, yeah. over here is a bit. Mm. Uh, if you did it too often, I could see that. People yeah, might no, I, I, I can see why that would be a, a problem. 
Yeah. Okay. Right. And uh, now Mark, but not this Mark, uh, <laughs> another Mark, asks... Not Mark Shuttleworth not either. Not Mark Shuttleworth you? either, no. We confused, we should say, we confused Dave um, by saying that, oh, uh, Mark's going to come onto the show tonight, and he did think it was going to be Mark Shuttleworth. Um, and it's obviously Mark Johnson. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so this is, uh, this is uh, we'll put a link to this in the show notes, but this is Honison Community College. And uh, Mark asks, Is it me or does my daughter's new school logo look some sort of familiar to you? <laughs> I've just seen it. <laughs> it is it is a bit uh, like the uh, the Circle of Friends. It's even it? got the, the colour um, sort of Passing on alternation. Each, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, they've gone with like a dark blue, a light blue and a, and a sort of yellowy orange, I think. Um, but other than that, and it's slightly triangular compared with the Ubuntu logo, but that's the only difference. Really. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be interesting to know if anybody else has got uh, examples of the Ubuntu logo being perhaps uh, inspiring other yes. logo designers, let's I say. I wonder that. if we could find out the uh, the marketing company who came up with that yeah. and see what they use on their desktops. Um, yeah. <laughs> Or what the webmaster uses. There are quite a few companies who have uh, logos that are very similar to the Debian Swirl as well. Yeah, there's a company in Southampton. It's right on the front of the building. Oh, yeah, it's like a dentist or something, yeah. isn't it? Oh, I've seen that, yeah. <laughs> in fact, I think that might be my dentist. <laughs> right. Oh, well, that explains it then. Well, next time you'll have to ask them what they run on their servers, won't you? Next time you of go course. there to have a filling. Maybe oh. they use Open Molar. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, there you go. Somebody's <laughs> been paying attention. <laughs> But yeah, next time you're there, we go, I'm so being on the service as you're having your teeth drills. Um, but yeah, it's a very easy kind of thing to copy, I guess. It, it's the sort of shell, isn't it? It's the, the sort of spiral pattern, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, okay. Well, if you've seen the Ubuntu logo or other free software logos uh, being used or, or abused elsewhere, um, <laughs> send us in a link and, uh, and we'll um, cover that. And that's uh, the end of your feedback. And that's the end of the show. You can find out how to get in touch with us on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org, including voicemail numbers and Twitter feeds, Facebook and IRC channels. Let us know what you think of the show and give us your thoughts about Ubuntu and the community around it. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. Have you enjoyed this evening? I certainly have. Excellent. You've done a great job. Yeah. And you've not looked too scared. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not sounded too scared, because that's what's important. The yeah. next episode, of course, is going to be our live one from Dublin. So we'll be back in four weeks' time with a, a normal episode. And uh, we'll hope you'll tune in then. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.